This might be one of my most favorite interviews I've ever done, mainly because it combines two of my greatest loves, birds and gardening. So if you follow me on socials, you know that I am a crazy bird lady. Officially, I'm obsessed with birds. I live for my hummingbirds in the summer. I've trained them to sit on my finger while they drink out of the hummingbird feeders that I have all over my house. I have multiple other bird, like seed bird feeders outside my office window. And actually, as I'm recording this episode intro for you, I am looking out my window and seeing that we have three juncos. We have a few black capped chickadees. Mr. and Mrs. Morning Dover here, and we also have a few song sparrows outside having lunch with me. And Frankie is obsessed with them. Every time the Morning Doves show up, Frankie like completely freaks out and starts chirping at them. It's so cute. And of course, if you've listened to the show before, you know the love of my life, my parakeet Frankie, who routinely chimes in in the background of these interviews. I love birds so much and I love gardening so much. And when I realize there is someone else out there who shares my joint passion so deeply for birds and gardens, that she has written an entire book on how to make a bird-friendly garden and optimize your garden for the birds, I knew I needed to meet and befriend her immediately. So today we talk about how to optimize our gardens to become safe spaces for our feathered friends, and I totally lose my mind. So get ready to giggle. Welcome to the Growing Joy with Plants podcast, where we not only learn how to care for plants successfully, but how to simply and affordably use our plant babies to cultivate more joy in our lives by doing so. I'm Maria, former plant killer turned happy plant lady, author of Growing Joy, The Plant Lover's Guide to Cultivating Happiness, speaker, podcaster, and most importantly, your new best plant friend. On Growing Joy with Plants, you'll find conversations about houseplant care, gardening tutorials, and wellness through the lens of plants. Hello, plant friends. Welcome back. If you are joining us again, welcome home to the Growing Joy with Plants podcast. And if you're new here, hi, I'm Maria, the host of the podcast, and I help you care for plants successfully and grow joy in your life while doing so. Oh my goodness, today's episode. (laughs) I'm kind of embarrassed to air today's episode, plant friends, because I really let my crazy bird lady flag fly really high. Like I have no cool in this episode. I am so giddy with Jen McGinnis, who is the author of Bird Friendly Gardening. She's also known as Frau Zinni on socials in her blog. She's the most adorable plant friend I've ever met. She's so cute and so knowledgeable. I'm in love with her. I'm in love with her book. And I'm just like so embarrassed with how I behaved in this interview. I like couldn't handle my excitement about talking to another person who loves birds as much as I do. It's so nerdy. (laughs) But you should love birds too. And I hope this episode (laughs) inspires you to love birds as much as I do, or maybe not as much as I do, but to really get into birds, because you're going to find out that there's so many different reasons why bringing birds into your garden is good for you and for the environment. They're pollinators for so many of our plants. Their bird song is so intoxicating to listen to, especially in the mornings and at dusk. They're so fun to watch, especially if you get to see baby birds emerge from their nests. And they remind you that our gardens are an ecosystem that we are a small part of. Yes, we might be stewards of the land, but we are stewards of the land for the native animals that are present. And we'll get into it with Jen, but the birds need our help more than ever. So let's give them our help (laughs) with this episode. Oh boy. Before we dive in, I'd love to ask you if you have been enjoying the content so far, if today's episode makes you smile, or if one of our most recent episodes have made you smile, if you could please take a minute and send the episode to your best plan friend or put it on your social media or email it to someone, right? I really want this podcast to serve as many people as possible. And I want this accessible, free educational information to be readily available for whoever needs it. So shoot your favorite episode to your best plan friend. Without further ado, get ready to giggle at me for the entire episode with how ridiculous I act. And thank you in advance to Jen for just handling me, handling me in this interview. Here's Jen. Jen, the bird lady, the plant lady, welcome to Growing Joy. I am so excited to have you on the show today to talk about my second favorite hobby, birds, next to my first favorite hobby, plants. Thank you so much for having me on today. And yes, I can't wait to talk birds and plants and all good green things. 
I was having dinner with my husband yesterday and I was like, I get to interview. I get to do an interview on bird friendly gardens tomorrow. And he was like, oh my God, are you just, you've made it. Like you've officially made, that's your highest (laughs) joy is birds and plants. As my little baby bird, Frankie, Frankie, my baby parakeet knows that we're talking about birds today. So I have a feeling he's going to be very vociferous in the background when we're talking. So just a heads up to you and to the listeners. I have just fallen in love with you. I followed you on Instagram. I've fallen in love. Your passion for birds, your passion for gardening is so obvious. I've read your book. It's incredible. So for those who don't know you already, Jen, will you let us know how you became the plant and bird lady that you are today? Sure. So it was a natural progression. I started growing out my own food, but then I learned more about organic gardening practices and the benefits for that with the food I grow and with the soil. And then that turned out to be beneficial to pollinators. So I started getting into the gateway of how do I make my garden more appealing to the pollinators? And then I really wanted to attract more butterflies and bees to the garden. And then I started planting more native plants to attract them. But then I started noticing that the birds were showing up in the garden and they were also appreciating those native plants and especially the insects that those native plants also hosted. So I've always been fascinated by birds. I don't consider myself a hardcore birder in any way. And I feel like there's a way to make your garden more accessible to the birds to bring you joy, just so you could look outside and see them in the garden. And you don't have to go far. You don't have to go on an expedition to go see birds. You can have them right there in your garden. You know, this is very interesting because what I have found now is gardening opens up a world of joy, like growing joy, my brand, you know, you grow joy in your garden, but it's not just growing the plants. It's growing all the other stuff that comes around with it. It's growing awe through watching plants grow. It's connecting to birds, right? It's listening to bird song. And, you know, bird song has been scientifically proven to reduce stress hormones in your body. Like the human body loves being in the presence of bird song. It's understanding pollinators. It's understanding bees better. It's It opens your world up to gardening just as the key to unlocking so much joy. And for me, hummingbirds were my gateway bird. I don't know if you follow me on Instagram, but some of my most viral videos on Instagram have been me and my hummingbirds uh, because I've, you know, they come back every year. I've been on my property for three years. I have hummingbird feeders and I'll hold them and they'll come sit on my finger and drink for me. They've really become part of our family at this point. My husband and I will have dinner on our balcony. They'll have their dinner at their feeder. They'll be right next to us, kind of buzzing around, hanging out with us. It's pretty wild. And now to the point where if their hummingbird feeder is empty and we miss it, they will come and flit and look at us through the window and be like, excuse me, we're hungry. Can you please feed us? And um, man, that connection is just magical. I'm just obsessed. And it's just so cool that you've dedicated a whole book to this passion of bringing birds back. So. Do you have a gateway bird? Like, do you have some sort of experience with a bird that kind of led you down this path? Yeah, I would say that my original gateway bird, because I have a ton of favorite birds and I feel like they change based on the season, kind of like how I can't pick a favorite plant, you know? (laughs) My original one was the Northern Cardinal because I grew up in Queens. So it was pretty, you know, cityscape. We were lucky to have a small yard, but in the winter, we would put out a bird feeder and we would attract the cardinals. And I was just so enthralled as a kid with how bright they were and the red colors, especially of the male cardinals. And that was just what hooked me, just being able to attract them to the garden and have them be a part of my life when I was little. And that was such an important connection to nature for me. So when I had an opportunity to have my own home and my own garden, Obviously, like setting up the feeders was a no brainer for me. But then it was as I continued evolving as a gardener, I learned that there's a lot more to creating a bird friendly garden. Instead, it's just not adding a feeder. It's so many other things that you can do that help attract them. So let's talk about that, because I think most of us think bird friendly bird feeder. But for most gardeners, bird feeders aren't great because it attracts squirrels and attracts things that is going to eat your garden. So what does bird-friendly gardening mean that is beyond the bird feeder? Can you kind of unpack that a little bit more? Totally. So you're looking to create a habitat in your area of land, whether you have a small balcony area or a small garden, or if you have access to a large piece of property, which is awesome if you do. 
but then it's incorporating native plants into your garden that will provide food, cover, and nesting protection for the birds that are either calling your home their habitat in their home or the ones that are migrating through in the spring or the fall. And why is bird-friendly gardening important? What's happening to the birds these days as society grows and grows into these cities? Sure. A lot of plantings at houses right now feature plants that are not native. So that's a limited amount of food resources for the birds. And then you combine that with the creation of like soccer fields and new condos being put in, and you're taking away more and more of that land that the birds are using to find food and to live on. So combine that with, you know, climate change issues and pesticide use. And a lot of the birds that we have, a lot of them have declined since 1970. We've actually lost 29% of the birds, which is crazy. It's like 3 billion birds. And we're on track to lose another 50% in the next 50 years in North America, according to the State of the Birds report. It's just like something has to be done to stop and help the birds. And you can be a part of that, which is so empowering because I feel like there's so many natural issues today that you look at and you're like, well, what can I do? Like, this is such a bigger issue than than me. But putting out, you know, some plants in your garden and offering some fresh water and safety for those birds is something that you can do to help them survive. So it's very empowering. It's, gosh, it's just something you can do that's good for nature and for yourself. It's a controllable. I love that. And I do feel like when we talk about these big conversations like climate change and sustainability, which can get so overwhelming and people feel so much pressure to speak out and to be a part of every single movement, like you can just simply create a habitat for some birds because, I mean, birds are pollinators. Birds are part of the food chain. Like I would imagine if we lose 50% of the birds, that's going to dramatically impact the rest of the ecosystem of the Northeast or of, you know, wherever these declines are being reported. Yeah, which just, it's just makes, it hurts my heart. I don't know why I'm so connected to birds. I wonder if I was a bird in a past life or something, but it hurts my heart to think about that. Yeah, I totally agree with you. And I hate to think that someday I'd have to go to an aviary or a sanctuary to see the birds that I kind of take for granted today. Um, And a lot of the birds that are threatened by climate change right now include like the hummingbird, like the Allen's hummingbird out West or the Baltimore Oreo on just, I mean, got to do something to help them. And this is the easiest way. <laughs> yeah. You were talking about the Cardinal too. I love the Cardinal. <laughs> we, Mr. and Mrs. Cardinal l- live outside and they come and visit my bird feeders. I have to say though, the the bright red contrast against the snow is incredible. Yes. But there's something about Mrs. Cardinal with her gray coat and her subtle red flashes that I'm like, you're the leader here. Like you don't have to show off, but we know you have the power, Mrs. Cardinal. I don't know. I love her. That's right. Yeah. (laughs) She's very stylish. He's bringing her the food. (laughs) Yeah. She's very subtle, very subtle. So, okay. We understand why we should put birds or why we should attract birds in our garden for the earth's purpose. But what about for our purpose? So how is bringing birds, how is having a bird friendly garden going to help my garden grow and help me as a person? Well, I think Definitely as a person, there have been a lot of studies that show that bird song or seeing the birds is beneficial to our mental health. They also keep insect pests in check in your garden, especially when you grow those native plants that attract the insects that feed them. And those native plants, once you have them established in your garden, they often use less water and they can also help with like cost savings for your water bill, whether that's a container garden or a backyard, large backyard space or other other area. Yeah, this is perfect. I feel like last month that we released an episode on how to make a tiny meadow in your space with Graham Gardner. And I feel like this is a perfect companion episode to that because he talks about native plants. For anyone who didn't listen to that episode, but P.S. you should because it was so good. Can you define what a native plant means and why the native plants are so important for the birds instead of a non-native plant? Sure. So native plants are basically they've been in America we'll say for this reason, the whole time. They haven't been imported from another spot. And because they have been acclimated to our climate and to our region, they actually work with the insects in our area. So 
those insects feed on those plants. One example is like the monarch butterfly, right? So those caterpillars can only eat the milkweed. They can't eat anything else. And then that's what they need to survive. So a lot of plants in gardens that are from like Asia or Europe, they don't support those native insects. And if you don't have the native insects to feed on those plants, you're not going to have the birds come in to eat those native insects. So you're missing out on a food source for them. You know, they're beautiful. They could be like hydrangea macrophylla or, you know, boxwood, look, which look nice in your, your landscape. But it's something that will benefit the whole ecology of, of the garden when you plant native. The summer brings tons of opportunities to give gifts, whether it's for weddings, graduations, showers, anniversaries, holidays, and what better gift to give someone you love than a personalized Wind River wind chime. Plus, you don't need to leave your house to shop for one. Wind River Chimes will deliver the most magical, most thoughtful, and personalized gift straight to the door of your beloveds because when you use the code GROWINGJOY at checkout, you get a free engraving on any engravable wind chime so you can personalize it for your loved one with a special saying, a memorable date, or a name. For over 35 years, Wind River Chimes has been passionately pursuing harmony by delivering wind chimes that help create a peaceful, soothing, and restful environment. And now that we are in the swing of gardening season, in Enjoy the perfect gardening weather with the perfectly calming and inspiring sound of Wind River Chimes. Every night in the summer, I sit on my balcony garden with a drink, just listening to the chimes in the wind, looking at the stars. It's a freaking dream, and it makes an amazing gift for yourself or for someone else. So all you have to do is to go to windriverchimes.com and use code GROWINGJOY at checkout to get a free engraving on any engravable wind chime. They have options of colors and sounds. You can just go on the website and click through and listen to all the beautiful sounds. It's so relaxing. Get it engraved with that personalized name or anniversary date or special message. Head to windriverchimes.com to listen to all of the melodious options and use code GROWINGJOY for a free engraving. You know that feeling when you find a product that is so amazing you can't help but spread the word to everyone you know? That is me with the gardener supply company, Cedar Ray's Beds. I have been obsessed with them for ages. I got one for my mom for Christmas two years ago in Florida. And my sister, who also lives in Florida, liked it so much. She got herself one and wanted to install multiple before her baby came. And if you follow me on social media, you know, I just surprised my sister with an entire gardener supply company raised bed garden farm for her baby shower. It was epic. You should go check that content out on socials. Are you ready to join the Gardner Supply Company bandwagon with me? Gardner Supply Company is a company owned and run by gardeners, making growing easier and more fun for over 40 years. Whether you have acres or just a balcony, they've got everything you need for successful indoor and outdoor growing. If you are dreaming of fresh tomatoes, they have you covered with containers, supports, specialized soils, fertilizers, and treatments. Make this summer your tastiest tomato season yet. I know I will be. Don't take my word for it. Peruse their website like you would peruse a clothing store. Sometimes I just go on gardeners.com and just look around and see what's cool <laughs> in the gardening space. They have so much stuff. So you can go to gardeners.com slash growing joy and you can unlock free shipping when you use the code growing joy at checkout. So once again, that's gardeners.com slash growing joy for all your gardening needs and exclusive innovations and use code growing joy to unlock free shipping. <music> There was one page in your book that I, when I got to it, I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. But you had pictures of all the different birds and these symbols of what they eat. And then, you know, if they're an insect feeder or a berry, whatever. So what are the different things birds do eat that we should be considering? Because I don't know, some people are probably so disconnected from birds and animal, you know, native animals. They didn't know that birds eat insects, right? Like what does a bird eat in general? And where is that in my garden that I might not recognize? <laughs> yes, I love that illustration. I was so happy when we were able to include that. So a lot of people, you know, think, oh, birds eat seeds, right? Like I put them out in the in the winter in a bird seed feeder, but they also eat different types of insects. So they'll be eating the caterpillars. Some might eat the beetles or ants, like the northern flicker. They actually hunt on the ground for for ants to eat. Some will eat spiders. And then there's 
other birds that will be slightly larger and they'll eat things such as snakes. I'm thinking now of like the owls and the hawks and the eagles. They'll go after voles and mice, even frogs, fish, small mammals, which unfortunately, you know, squirrels and rabbits sometimes fall into that category, but won't think about that. <laughs> and then you have um, other categories too, like the hummingbirds, they'll go for the nectar of a flower, or you can put out sugar water to attract them. A lot of birds will also be attracted to plants that produce berries, and then small cones, such as like pine cones and trees. So a lot of birds are attracted to particular plants. And there's not like one size that fits all. So that's why when you incorporate a variety of those native plants in your garden, you have your best option for attracting a different variety of birds coming through to to call your garden home and, and find a place to eat. Wow. And then in terms of like native grasses and stuff, you're waiting for those native grasses to, to go to seed and then the birds will eat the seed pods. Is that how it works? Yes. Um, sometimes they use the grass to even help like build their nests. So, or sometimes for cover too, depending on if um, the type of region that they're based in, they might be using that to hide from predators. But yeah, most of the time you're adding those native grasses to your garden and the seeds will feed them in you know the fall and into the winter. Speaking about nests, can we take a moment to talk about the genius of how these little birds that have tiny brains know how to create an architecturally sound nest? I don't know if anybody has ever been able to like hold a bird's nest in their hand. We have one sweet bird nest right above our lamp right outside of our house. And I put my phone up there to take a photo of it, to take a peek. And like the architectural intelligence of bird's nests blows my freaking mind. How on earth do these birds know how to put sticks and grass together to make a home that is structurally sound enough to house their babies? It's unbelievable. Like in terms of just allowing yourself to have a moment of awe, if you create a habitat in your garden that allows a bird to build its nest, let alone just watching the nest get built. But then if you get to watch that bird have babies, are yes. you kidding me? <laughs> yeah, it is so awesome because you can have different areas of the yard where those birds will create nests. Like I have robins who love to make nests in the honeysuckle arbor that I have out front. And then they'll sometimes switch it up and they'll try to do it on top of my, um, they'll try to make a nest on top of my lamp post, you know, sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. But then up in the, um, the cherry tree out front, there'll be another bird that'll nest out there. I'll put out bird houses for some of the birds that actually will frequent those. That'll be like the wrens or sometimes the chickadees, bluebirds you can attract with bird houses. So, and then there's like birds who just do what they want, like the morning doves. You could have a shelf system outside, you know, for your garden tools and everything. And they'll just decide like, yeah, this is good enough for me. I'll I'll nest here. And then you have to kind of work around like, oh, don't put your clay pots here because <laughs> the morning does are occupying this right now. <laughs> Incredible. The best neighbors ever. Obsessed. Okay, so let's talk about bird migration, because that's something that even to me as I've developed this ridiculous relationship with my hummingbirds, I go through like two days of grief. Yes. In September when they leave, when I've realized that they have left and they don't say goodbye to me <laughs> or I don't realize they're <laughs> saying goodbye to me. Can you explain the migration of birds and why it's so important for us to create these homes for them in their great migrations? Totally. So some of the birds that we see will stay here year round. So we're talking about like you mentioned the hummingbirds, some of the warblers, they'll spend their winters or yeah, their winters down South in tropical areas because then they'll have more access to food, more insects to eat. And then they'll come back up here when it's our summertime. So a lot of the birds that do migrate in the spring and the fall, they're going to follow major flight paths that follow the geography of our continent. And it's easy to picture like where those flight patterns are based on the names of them. There's four major ones. And those are the Pacific Flyway, the Central Flyaway, the Mississippi Flyaway. So you can see we're like moving across to the east and then the Atlantic Flyaway. So like the ruby-throated hummingbird, they're using the Atlantic Flyaway to come up to see us in the springtime and the summer. 
So knowing which birds use which flyway help you anticipate when they're going to arrive in your area or when they're going to be passing through. And one of the online resources that I love to access, and it's free, which is great, is called BirdCast. Have you used that? No. Oh, okay. This is awesome. So BirdCast, I think it's like birdcast.info. They... um track which birds are coming through your area. It's um, put together with data from Colorado State University and the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And they track the nocturnal migration of the birds. And you can check the site, see who's coming through your area. And then the next day you can go outside and see if like that actual warbler is in your backyard. And that's a lot of the ways that I've actually found some of the more unique birds passing through because I've checked that website the night before and I'll say, oh, he's in the neighborhood. I'm going to go out looking for him the next day. So they are active during the spring migration and the fall migration. So you should definitely check it out. Spring migration started on March 1st. So it's still okay. happening. <laughs> so one, I do want to give a shout out. They're not, they don't sponsor the show. I begged them to sponsor the show. You mentioned Cornell Ornithology. There is this incredible app called Merlin. Yes. I'm sure you know Merlin. I think you you mentioned it in your book. Okay. The amount of people that I have made download Merlin, I will sit. So Merlin ID, that's the name of the app. It's by Cornell Department of Ornithology. It has this cool thing where you can open. It's basically like opening a voice memo, but it has voice ID. So I will sit on my balcony in the summer with the voice ID. I'll turn it on. And I'll listen to the bird song because I live in the woods. So we have a lot of birds in the woods. And it will literally decode what birds are singing and then pop up. Oh, this is the yunko. This is the chickadee. This is the crow, whatever. And I've learned so much about my local birds from Merlin because I'm just such a nerd. While other people go out to bars, I'm like, whatever, I'll drink my glass of wine with the Merlin bird ID <laughs> my porch. That's awesome. And yeah, I'm obsessed. It's a great beginner friendly tool if you're interested in getting because the one thing with birding, I feel like and I do feel like we should name this. This isn't an episode on birding. I have so much respect for birders, right? I will become I will retire and become a birder. I feel that deeply in my bones. But I think birding can feel a little overwhelming. Sometimes it's like you got to get the fancy binoculars and there's just so many birds and so much knowledge that we don't know being disconnected from them and also them kind of being hidden in trees and stuff. And I just feel like the beginner friendly way to do this is to just build a garden that attracts them. And then as you see them, learn about them using the Merlin app or, you know, all these free resources that we can have. So anyway, I'll get off my soapbox. <laughs> no, I, I totally agree with you. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, what were we even just talking about? I have no idea. I just like talked about the app for <laughs> three minutes, but I'm obsessed with it. I know we just we're just endorsing everybody here that's helping us with the birds. <laughs> yeah, Cornell, throw us a bone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No, it's totally true. Like I have a bunch of friends who also I've told them about the app and they've downloaded it. And then we'll like we'll take screenshots when we have the birds show up like, look who's in my yard, you know, and it also helps because sometimes it's really hard to like remember the bird IDs, especially of like woodpeckers or just like all the little birds, you know. So the fact that it comes up on a screen and you could say, oh, that's I have a tufted titmouse in my yard. Or my friend and I like to call them murder floofs because they're just so attitude-y, you know? So we'll joke around about that. But yeah, it definitely helps you break in and learn about the birds without being intimidated. Like, I have a lot of respect for the birding community, but yeah, I feel a lot more comfortable going into my yard, observing and being a part of that nature as opposed to going out on an outing and, you know, with my binoculars and hoping I see something, you know? <laughs> yeah. Totally, which also sounds incredible, but just right. not, I'm not quite in that phase of life yet. Okay, so let's talk about nests. Okay. How do birds make their nests? I mean, we I, we went off on the rampage of how much we love the nests, but what in our gardens can we grow and can we set up to make nest building easier for birds? Sure. So we had mentioned before the ornamental grasses. So like big blue stem grass, that's a, a good one that they can use. There's also something called seagrass where they'll pull the grass out also to make the nest. Some birds like wrens, they'll just gather a lot of little twigs in the garden and they'll use that to build their nest. Some birds nest on the ground. So that's more of like out on like 
you know, the Great Plains type of area, but there are instances even, you know, here in the Northeast where dark eyed juncos, they'll nest on the ground. Metal larks, I believe, also nest on the ground. So when you're going into a nature preserve, this is, you know, outside of your garden, keeping your dogs on a leash, that's also like a great thing you can do to help them survive, just so those nests don't get trampled or the birds get, you know, scared and and leave the nest. Also for your garden, there's things that you can have out there that might be a part of your life because of just, you know, the pets that you own. That can be chicken feathers, alpaca fur. Those make great nesting material. You can put them into like a suet feeder, the wire ones, and then the birds can come and just like pick out what they want. I've seen the chickadees do that a lot. And there's also uh, grapevine bark. That's also great to leave out there for them. And it's also important to pick up the trash. I know this is, sounds kind of off topic, but robins will especially find anything that can be used and use that in their nest. And I've seen them use like plastic pieces of um, litter (laughs) to line their nest. So they're very resourceful. So giving them the tools that will create a healthy nest is also important too. So you will put a suet feeder, a bird feeder filled with alpaca fur out. They're not coming for seeds. They're literally coming for the fur to help with their nest. Are you mixing it with seeds or it's just the pure alpaca? Yeah, just the pure um, fur. And sometimes they're also sold like in willow balls and they're just, you could just hang them from a bush and they'll just come and help themselves. I've seen it done for hummingbirds too, where they have like that cage with the the cottony mat mat in there, but I haven't personally seen hummingbirds take it. I would love (laughs) to have a hummingbird nest in my yard, but I haven't, it hasn't happened yet. (laughs) Oh my God, they're so little. I've seen them on social media. They're so little. I feel like people don't understand how little hummingbird bodies are because they look bigger with their wings always flapping, but their bodies are like as big as a jelly bean. Right. Yeah, I know that that would be the ultimate to have a hummingbird nest in the yard. So I'm still working on that one. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Okay. And then what about nesting boxes? So like I was gifted an owl box a couple years ago, like People get kind of crazy. They make like replicas of their house on stilts for birds. So what's the purpose of a nesting box? And should we be trying to incorporate a nesting box into our garden as well? Sure. So the nesting box, like the whole diameter of the box is really what's important because different species of birds will use different size holes to get into the box. Sometimes the decorative birdhouses include entry holes that are just a little too large that make it really easy for like predators to get in there. Like like a squirrel, they'll go after like the eggs, you know, or a snake. Sometimes they can go up the pole and take out the birds also. So you want to minimize that threat. So definitely you're looking for a birdhouse that's advertised for a specific diameter. And I believe it like ranges between an inch and a quarter to an inch and a half, depending on what type of bird you want to attract. The placement of where you're putting that birdhouse also is important. Anything that's too close to the ground. Generally, you want it to be three feet or higher just to also minimize threat from the predators. You'll ideally not want cats around. Um, They're one of the biggest, you know, consumers, if you will, of, of birds, and they're a big threat to them. So if you have neighborhood cats, that's something to consider when you're having the birds come to your garden. Like you're going to want to make sure that if you have a bird bath, you're putting it in an area where they can easily spot that cat and get out of there. You don't want to put something in an area where they're camouflaged and makes makes it a lot easier for that cat to be hunting. Ideally, we wouldn't have cats outside, but we have to work with what we're given, right? <laughs> so we're talking about bird-friendly gardening today. And when it comes to gardening, even before you choose what plants you're going to plant, you have to figure out how to set those plants up for success by putting them in high-quality soils, potting mixes, and then feeding them with organic, pet-safe, bird-safe products that will ensure your plants thrive. Espoma Organics is going to be your go-to brand to look for in the garden center when it comes to products like this. They're a 90-plus-year-old family-owned and operated company dedicated to making safe indoor and outdoor gardening products for people, pets, and the planet. If you're prepping your garden, you can start seeds in their seed starting mix. You can use uh, their wide variety of potting mixes, whether you're potting in containers, whether you have raised beds, whether you're growing in ground, they have potting mixes and soils for all of those different growing mediums. When you plant your plants, help them establish faster and grow deeper roots with the Biotone Starter Plant Food. All my garden is planted with a little sprinkle of Biotone upon 
planting into the ground or into the container. And then they have a line of tones, which is their fertilizers that are formulated for whatever you're gardening. So they have a garden tone, a bloom tone, a holly tone for acid loving plants, a flower tone, a berry tone if you're growing berries, a rose tone if you're growing roses, a tomato tone, which I've used on my tomatoes for the last three years. Whatever you're growing, they have the organic high quality products for it. And if you're a houseplant parent, all of my houseplants are potted up in their potting mix and I fertilize with their indoor liquid plant food every time I water throughout the spring and summer. To top it all off, they have a huge sustainability commitment with 100% solar-powered plant, zero-waste manufacturing, and eco-friendly packaging. To learn more about their indoor and outdoor products, visit espoma.com to see where your local Espoma dealers are, or click the link in the show notes to go to my Amazon storefront where I have a curated list of my favorite Espoma products. Thanks, Espoma. Okay, wow, that's really interesting. Now you mentioned bird baths. So how are birds using water and how can we bring water to our garden to support them? Is it as simple as getting a bowl of water and putting it out so that the birds can bathe in it? Or, you know, you see lots of expensive, fancy marble bird baths as well. So what are the different ways we can set our birds up for success with water in the garden? Yeah, so bird baths kind of fall into that category too with the birdhouses. Like some are really decorative And they might be too deep, which makes it not ideal for a bird to use. They want to be able to have shore footing in there. So they're going to want something that's not very slippery. If there is a bird bath you have that is deep, you can customize it by adding some rocks to it. So you're kind of bringing that level up for them. So they're not going too deep dive into the bird bath, so to say. We talked about the height placement. That's important. But you can also do ground bird baths as long as they're out in an open area. Right now in um, my garden, I have starting in the winter and leading into the spring because of the cold overnight temperatures, I have a heated bird bath and that's based on the ground. And that also attracts like a variety of other wildlife. Yeah. Tell me about your heated bird bath because I was on your website yesterday and I found you, you have like a a live stream of your bird bath. Yes. (laughs) It's like Twitch for birds, kind of like, tell me more about your live stream of your bird bath. And yes, and it says like heated bird bath. So, and where do you live? So I'm out of Connecticut. (laughs) Okay, out of Connecticut. Yeah, so actually this is a great, you know, if Birdsy wants to sponsor us, (laughs) here's another plug. So the Birdsy Birdsy camera. (laughs) (laughs) So I purchased the Birdsy camera, I would say, oh, maybe like two and a half, three years ago now. They were on Kickstarter and I just was enthralled by the idea of having a video camera for my birds. So I was like, sign me up. So I bought one camera put it on my heated bird bath and it records all the time. It is plugged into an outdoor outlet. So um, it is getting that constant power, but anytime there's motion, it's tripped and it records that video. So that could be the birds visiting. It could be other mammals. Like I get possums at night, raccoons, foxes, rabbits, a lot of things that I wouldn't know or even out there, but now I do thanks to that camera running. So I have two heated bird baths now, actually, and I'm happy with both of them. They both do a great job. They're also plugged into an electrical outdoor outlet during the winter. And what they do is it keeps the water from freezing. So when other natural sources are dried up or frozen up, I should say, this provides that fresh water so the birds can stop in and have access to that. And that's actually the first way I attracted bluebirds to my yard. It wasn't from the plants, actually or the feeders I had out, it was because I had fresh water available in the middle of winter and the flock just happened to be flying over. They spotted the water and they started visiting. So then once I had them hooked into the garden, then I was like, well, what else can I do to make them stay? You know, and this was during the winter that they were coming through. So then I went and bought like a special bluebird mealworm feeder. So now that's out there for them. And I've incorporated more plants that produce berries. So that way, when they're coming through, they can eat their dried mealworms, they can have their berries out front. So it's kind of like a gateway, but it all started in that case with just the fresh water source, you know, and keeping that water fresh is also important. You don't want it to get dirty and stagnant. And like, if you wouldn't want to drink it, the the birds aren't going to want to drink it either. You know, that's like kind of a good rule of thumb. And then you can also use in the summertime solar fountains. You can put those in your bird bath. And that's great because it creates the movement of water. So you're helping to not have, you know, mosquitoes lay eggs in there. But since you're refreshing that water constantly, hopefully you're not having that issue anyway. 
but then that sound of the water moving also attracts the birds in. So that's another great feature you can add to your bird bath too. My father-in-law got us this tiny little, we have a, we have a huge pond on our property. So we get epic birds like herons and all sorts of crazy birds, like dive bombing the pond to eat our fish. But he got us this like tiny, almost the size of a donut solar fountain that has different colors that lights up at night that will move around our pond, which is super cute. And also that sound of running water is so enjoyable for us. Like the sound of running water, once again, is like, like bird song, really healthy for our nervous systems to, to hear and, and relax too. So it's a win, win, right? It's a win for us and it's a win for the birds. Okay. So let's talk about bird feeders, because I do feel like bird feeders are the simplest, easiest entry point. You know, I went to the dollar store and got a dollar bird feeder and they sell bird feed at the at the dollar store too. So, you know, I started my bird journey for $5, right? But with the garden, it can be a little bit of a problem because the squirrels come, the rabbits come, you know, all sorts of stuff comes. So what are some good bird-friendly gardening, bird feeder practices if we want to set up a bird feeder? So the number one thing um, would be keeping it clean. That's like the most important thing you can do. And that's to help prevent the spread of like diseases, especially in house finches. They have something called the house finch eye disease, which is kind of like conjunctivitis for birds. So keeping your bird feeders clean helps prevent the spread of that. And if you did happen to have a bird visit that had the conjunctivitis, you'll want to take your feeder down and clean it with some um, bleach and water. There's a ratio... um, I believe it's it's in the book, but it's also, you could Google it and find it online pretty easily to clean that feeder and, and get it back out again. You'll want to make sure the food stays fresh. And that's important also for the hummingbird feeders too. You don't want that sugar water to get rancid in any way. Oh, you get that black mold so yeah. quick. Yeah. Bad news. <laughs> so that that's the same for the seed feeders too. You don't want to keep any food in there that's like clumpy or wet or growing mold. Definitely has got to go. When it comes to the type of feeder, it really depends what type of bird you're trying to attract. So the woodpeckers are definitely going to favor the suet feeders. I especially like the ones that have like a long piece of wood attached to them and it acts as like a tail prop. So it helps the bird kind of land on the suet feeder easier and balance on there while they're feeding. I've had a little bit more luck attracting the larger woodpeckers for with that style, You could have the high platform feeders that'll bring in, you know, the cardinals, it'll bring in the bluebirds, the starlings and the sparrows too are going to like those. So, oh man, there's squirrel guards you can put on feeders, um, ones that like close. So that way, if the squirrel is hanging off of it, he can't get the food inside. So it really depends what you're looking to attract. I would say that as long as the feeder is protecting the food inside, keeping it safe from the elements, that's a good start to begin with when it comes to a seed feeder. My parents got really into birds. During the pandemic, they put some bird feeders outside of their office, which was amazing because the birds are a great distraction just throughout your workday to just take your eyes off your screen. It's actually a practice I write about in my book, but they, you know, started spending a little bit more on their bird hobby and they bought this crazy bird feeder that spun when anything weighing heavier than a normal bird would go. So when the squirrels climbed up and grabbed the little rail that the birds would sit on to eat, it would spin and throw the squirrels off. But it wasn't weight sensitive enough to throw the birds off, like because the birds all weigh less than the squirrel. So I don't know how it works. But it was so funny to watch these squirrels get thrown off the bird feeder. And then the birds just happily sit there eating. I mean, I guess that's kind of mean. But Yeah, I think that's so interesting. And then what about, I have been looking at that, my bird buddy, like now they make these smart feeders that have cameras on them. That's really cool too. Yeah, and I think that's also like this technology that's happening with the bird buddy feeders, the birds camera. I think that's also helping people get into birding and gardening for birds because it's making it much more accessible for them. What's nice about that, product is that it also loads the video clips and the photos to an app on your phone so you can easily like go through it and see who's visiting and it does a pretty good job of identifying who's actually visiting your feeder and I mean sometimes just seeing the interactions between the birds is is hysterical in itself like you'll see some of these pictures that people are sharing and it's 
really evident that I know we're not supposed to personify birds and, you know, give them human traits, but like, I don't know, I can't help but think like some of them are really like the Blue Jays are bossy. <laughs> like you were saying before, the Cardinal is very stylish and she knows what's going on. You know, it's just it really comes through in those pictures. Even the hummingbirds, I mean, they will dive bomb each other if they're both at the the feeder, like they will get into major fights where sometimes I have to like go break up their fights and be <laughs> like, guys, let's all get along. There's plenty of liquid for all of you. <laughs> yeah. Calm down. <laughs> yeah. But I think that's I'm like, take my money. I, I want all the birdie things. So, OK, so we've talked about birds, bird friendly gardening specifically. So how do I figure out what plants to grow for my area? Like, how do I figure out what the right native plants are, either just to attract general birds or to attract specific birds that I know are in my area? Like, if I'm a total newbie, how would you recommend me going about selecting the right plants? Sure. So in the book, a lot of the projects and garden plans provide recommended plants that you can work into your garden, and that's based on your growing zone. So you'll want to go to the USDA site to look up and see what growing zone you're in if you're not familiar with that already. You can pretty much decide by the region. Also, a lot of the plants recommended in the book are broken up by like Northeast or Southwest. So you can kind of group like, oh, okay, this is going to work in my general area. So that's a good start. On the Audubon site, they actually have a native plant finder where you can type in your zip code and they'll generate a list of plants that you might want to consider also. So there's a lot of accessible ways to find those plants, obviously, like going to independent garden centers that stock those plants. They're going to be a great resource for you, too, of um, plants that work well in your region. Speaking of Audubon, you know what's so funny? Audubon has my freaking number. They sent me (laughs) Audubon is what? It's a national bird organization. Yes. So um, there's a national Audubon and then there's chapters that report up to to them that also promote bird conservation and all the things we've been talking about that are great about attracting them to your gardens and helping them survive. So I guess I donated them to them last year and I was opening my mail yesterday. So, so funny because I literally have this on my desk right now. They sent me a sticker sheet of responding. So like my name with my address and then hummingbirds next to them. Oh, they know you. I was like, Audubon, (laughs) you're really hustling for my donation. But obviously I'm going to donate to them. I'm like, please send me more of these hummingbird (laughs) personalized stickers. Thank you, Audubon. (laughs) So anyway, I should send them this episode when it comes out. You know, I thought it was cool that you have in your book, like how to grow your own bird seed. That's kind of fun. Yeah. So how would I go about growing my own bird seed if I just wanted to take it to the next level and not even have bird feeders, but just have my garden be the bird feeder? Yeah. So there's probably a lot of things that people are doing already to grow their own bird seed, but they may not be thinking of it in that way. One plant in particular is the coneflower. That's a plant that if you leave them standing in the fall, it'll be a natural bird feeder. The finches will come in, they'll feed off of those seed heads. Sometimes it doesn't even make it to the winter because they're just so delicious and they can't help themselves in the fall, you know? Another one is sunflower seeds. And there's a way to grow those sunflowers. And then when they're starting to have the seeds ripen, you can cover the seed head with like a paper bag or cheesecloth and tie it off. And that allows the seeds inside to ripen and keep the birds off of it at that time. So that way, if you do want to harvest them and then put them back out in the wintertime, you have that sunflower seed that would be available then. And that's also helpful to protect them from the squirrels too, because they're going to be going after them as well, because sunflower seed seems to be like one of the most delicious ones for for seed options. (laughs) Well, and now I feel like on TikTok, everybody's eating sunflower heads. They're like grilling full sunflower heads and eating them like steaks, which I have not done. Yeah. I know I see that and I'm like, no, that's the bird food. (laughs) Yeah, I know. I'm like, I'll leave that for my birds. But I will say we, I have such pest pressure up by me with deer and bulls and rabbits that I can't really grow. I can only grow my balcony. And I didn't grow sunflowers this year. But last year, my mom used to grow 200 sunflowers on her front lawn and the squirrels would scale the sunflowers until they tipped over to then wrestle the sunflower head on the ground and eat it all. The squirrels really hustle. They hustle. They do. They you know, you got to respect it. You got to respect the hustle, <laughs> but I'm not here for it. 
worth it. <laughs> the squirrels are slowly becoming my enemy. So in addition to a water feature, in addition to a bird feeder, in addition to growing your own seeds, are there any other like aspects or features of a garden that we should create? I know you said housing is really important, like shelter. Is there anything else we should be putting in our garden that provides shelter for birds? I just heard your your friend over there. I know. <laughs> he was like, yeah, give it, give him shelter. Yeah, Frankie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you're basically going to want to provide the food, the shelter, the cover, and the water. So the food can, you know, be those berry producing shrubs. I have a lot of blueberry bushes out front in my garden. And I like to think that I get some of them in the summer, but a lot of the birds help themselves mm-hmm. first. You grow them for the birds. That's funny. Yeah. And they they totally have my number. They're just like, oh, there she is. She grew this for us. <laughs> There'll be a lot of trees that fruit, the crab apples, they're good to have. There's also trees that will attract insects, like oaks are perfect examples of that. And I believe Doug Tallamy quotes and like, totally promotes oak trees like all the time about how they're such a good food source and life source for so many insects and birds. So if you can incorporate one of those into your garden, that's fantastic. And there are some smaller varieties. I think a lot of people think oak trees like the humongous, beautiful oak that is picturesque and took years to grow, but there are some smaller varieties out there to try too. We mentioned the native grasses. They're great to incorporate the flowers, like the coneflowers. I grow a lot of asters. I really like those because they not only bring in the insects that the birds will eat, but I leave them all standing in the front yard and then the birds will come and eat the seeds throughout the winter. And then they're usually so tall that they also provide cover also. So when the hawk is flying over, the birds can kind of hide in that front yard and have a little bit more of a chance than if they were out on someone's front lawn where there is no cover, right? Wow. Interesting. Okay. Wow. Any tips for hummingbirds for making my house even more of the hummingbird haven that it is? Because I think hummingbirds are a big entry. Like I feel like when I post about my hummingbirds, everybody comments and is like, yeah, I'm obsessed with my hummingbirds too. I feel like they're a good entry bird to get people jazzed. Yeah. They're totally like a gateway. (laughs) Yeah. So you'll want to look for red and yellow flowers. Really any bright colored flower that isn't very fragrant will also help attract the hummingbirds to your garden. A lot of them can be planted into containers like window boxes or, um, you know, large patio pots. And there's one project in the book that talks about creating a hummingbird haven. And that focuses on those native plants that have the tubular shape of the flower, the nice bright colors. You can also add a water mister to your small bird bath. So before we had talked about like a solar fountain that would create that spray of water for the birds, I've noticed that the hummingbirds are more attracted to the mist. They can fly in and out of it. They really like that. Cool. Oh my God, I bet that's so cute. (laughs) (laughs) I've also seen like videos where they bathe like on top of a bubbling fountain. That's cute. Uh If you want something adorable, you definitely Google that. So yeah, you can mix those small water features in with your container groupings and plantings. But when you're picking your plants, you want to make sure you're doing a succession of bloom. So you'll want to be choosing plants that bloom in the spring, summer, and into the fall. So that way the birds have like a constant reason to come back and visit your patio area or the garden. If you have just plants that bloom in the spring, and they, that's great. It's food for them when they show up. They'll be looking for more throughout the summer. And you can always supplement with those nectar feeders too. But seeing them go to the different flowers, uh, gosh, it's just, it's so magical seeing them zip around and what they choose too. There's some plants that I would think they wouldn't be interested in and, and they still visit. Like I've seen them visit like the open daisies and I was like, oh, you're not supposed to go to those. But I mean, I guess it was bright and colorful enough that they did. (laughs) Yeah. They were like, let me just go check it out. Well, I can't believe we're at time already. I could talk to you about birds all day. (laughs) I feel like this is one of the, I've been the silliest in this interview because of of most of the interviews I've done lately, because I am just so genuinely excited to talk to you about this (laughs) topic. You have an amazing book. I mean, I read it. I read it this week. The thing I love about your book is it's perfect for someone like me who has identified their love for birds and joy, but doesn't have a lot of knowledge. The book really covers the migration, the nesting, what they eat. Like it really takes, it allows you to go to the next step, which I really like. 
because I feel like with your book, I'm going to be able to do even more fun bird friendly stuff in my garden next year. So before we wrap, I would love for you to share, you know, I also love how your your book is organized, small, medium, large spaces and different projects. So could you give us like an idea of easy projects that you could do if you only have a balcony to attract a bird and then an easy project to do if you do have like a nice little garden plot that has space. So kind of a small and a large opportunity to make your space more bird friendly? Totally. So the one that comes to mind for a small space is the native plant container garden section. There's a bunch of varieties that will stay small that you can either plant individually into their own pots, such as like a hanging basket, or group them together into like a small planter, like a like a 16 by 16 size planter. So you don't need something like humongous, which is nice for a lot of these plants. And I like to hang those like hanging baskets off of my backyard tent or just on hooks randomly in the garden. And they can include plants like low bush blueberry. They stay very small. Pilgrim cranberry is another one that's more of like a ground cover, but you can have a trail out of the um, hanging basket or some of the smaller black eyed Susans. They can be paired in there too. So that would be a great small project to start. And you can, you know, see what containers you have and take a look at the list of the plants in the book and see what would fit that that space. For like a medium sized garden, I would say there's a really cool deer resistant garden that I put together for the book. And I was able to test it out at my father-in-law's house. I got him on board to let me plant the garden there. And he's heavy on deer. And you were mentioning that too before that you have a lot of deer. So only the plants that made it made the cut in that list. Um, I did lose a few that were supposed to be deer resistant, but the deer ate anyway. Rest yeah. in peace, chokeberry. Me too. <laughs> yeah. R.I.P. Man. Yeah. I've I've had it with the deer. <laughs> My property. I'm over it. I'm over them. It was awesome because it also introduced him to plants that he normally wouldn't have chose at the garden center, which is like the big bluestem grass or the great coneflower, which is um this plant that grows like five to seven feet tall and they create these big seed heads that the finches just you know perch on and eat so these are things that were like outside of his comfort level but were deer resistant and just seeing it come together I was able to work in some of the plants he already had in his garden such as like orange butterfly weed and incorporate that in so it's also something that like you don't have to start with a blank slate you can work in those native plants gradually, you know, maybe take out one of the uh, European or Asian varieties, sub in a native one, or if it's too big to remove, just start planting some native selections in too. And then you can have a mix of a garden. It may not be all native, but some native is better than none. So it's really totally definitely accessible. I love that. Oh my gosh. I love it so much. Well, you're such a wealth of information. I've had so much fun talking to you. I'm Your book really got me excited. You know, I'm looking at my bird feeders right now, which are frozen and have old seed from the summer. I haven't refilled them in months. You're inspiring me. You know, I love putting bird feeders. So my desk faces a window. I have three bird feeders, one hummingbird feeder and two normals right outside the window with my wind chimes. So I can just enjoy birds and wind chimes all day long. <laughs> awesome. You're inspiring me to clean out my bird feeders, give them a really good sanitation, refill them. Where can everybody find you and your book? Sure. So I'm online as Frau Zinni. Um, I have my own site called frauzinni.com. I'm on Instagram and Facebook under the same accounts too. And the book can be found in all the major retailers, such as Amazon, Barnes and Noble, a bunch of independent bookstores, uh, such as like my local independent bookstore, Riverbend Bookshop. So yeah, it's widely available. Um, And I believe on Quarto's site, they even have a link that shows some of the outside of the U.S. vendors too. So it's not just the U.S. I guess to see it. So that's awesome. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I've just had a ball getting to know you and hopefully we'll have you back on for another bird-friendly episode in the future if people want it. Yeah. (laughs) I had such a great time talking with you and and I feel like we could talk all day about this topic. So thank you so much for letting me come on and and just talk birds and and gab about it. It's been a blast. (laughs) It's the dream. I'm living the dream right now. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I hope you loved this interview as much as I loved doing it. Thank you so much to Jen McGinnis. You can find her at frauzinni.com. That's Z-I-N-N-I-E. She's frauzinni on Instagram. She's the author of Bird Friendly Gardening. I love this book. If you are interested in gardening for your birds, please pick it up. 
It was just so much fun. I would just feel seen on such a new level (laughs) between our joint passion for plants and birds. Let me know if you liked this episode. Let me know if you have other requests for episode in the future on garden adjacent topics like this. I am installing a hummingbird friendly garden in my office patio. And if you follow me on YouTube, subscribe because that video should be coming out in the next couple of weeks. It's just how quickly we can get it edited. But I'm doing an entire patio filled with hummingbird friendly plants. And I'm so excited because the hummy boys are back. My hummingbirds are back and I have three feeders for them right now. And when the feeders run out, they like flap their wings and look at me in the window being like, excuse me, we're ready for more food. So hopefully planting some flowers that they're going to like is going to help. Stay tuned, follow along on Instagram and YouTube to see how that unfurls. You know, it's funny, my friend... And I were talking about my love for birds. And she was like, you know, birds really do just bring you so much joy. Like they just bring everyone so much joy. They're just it's so nice to have around. I think we were talking about the local owls in my woods. But anyway, birds are amazing. And if you haven't got on the birding train plant friends, I highly recommend it. You will not be disappointed. And a great place to start is in your garden. So I hope this episode was informative and that it helps you keep growing joy. Plant friend, thank you for tuning in today. It means so much to me that I get to be part of your planty journey. If you like what you heard, make sure you're subscribed to the show so you never miss an episode. We have so many incredible interviews and solo episodes on incredible houseplant and gardening topics that you will not want to miss this year. And while you're over there in the podcast player subscribing, why don't you click over to the review section of Growing Joy with Plants and leave us a review. Reviews are tremendously helpful for the growth of the podcast, so thanks in advance. If you're looking for more opportunities to grow as a plant parent with Growing Joy content, we've got so many options for you. First, I highly recommend you taking the Plant Parent Personality Test. It's free, it's super fun, it takes three minutes to complete. At the end of the test, you're gonna get your Plant Parent Personality Profile and a curated list of plants, projects, and podcast episodes that are right up your alley, tailored just for you and your lifestyle, inspired by your results. The links are in the show notes. If you're looking to uplevel your plant parent game, I have so many free downloads on my website that I think could help you, like the Understanding Natural Light download or nine different ways to green up your office space. If you'd like to support the show monetarily and help me bring the show to as many people as possible for free, you can head to our Patreon link in the show notes to learn more about our offerings. And finally, I invite you to come hang out with me and continue the planty conversation on social media, on Instagram and TikTok. I'm growing joy with Maria. My DMs are always open if you have requests for topics or ideas for the show. Thank you again for listening. It is truly my honor and delight to help you keep blooming and keep growing joy.